We will start with Thomas Edison and interweave many of the major historical lines that created the Florida Keys as we know them today. So let's start at the beginning with the invention of the light bulb. On the evening of October 2nd, 1879, Thomas Edison created what no one else had done before, a dependable electric light bulb. That first bulb burned for only 14 hours, but over the next month, Edison would approve that to 40 hours. On December 31st, 1879, Edison demonstrated his practical light bulb to the world from his Menlo Park, New Jersey laboratory. With it, the Wizard of Menlo Park, known for his 2,000 plus patents, promised safe, dependable lights for homes, businesses, and city streets. Edison then formed the Edison Electric Illuminating Company in 1880. The first central power plant, Pearl Street Station in Lower Manhattan, began generating direct current or DC electricity two years later. Around the same time, George Westinghouse, an American entrepreneur, became aware of the new European alternating current or AC systems. AC power systems allowed voltages to be stepped up for transmission over long distances without the severe power losses suffered by DC systems. The power is then stepped down for consumer use. With AC systems, Westinghouse envisioned large centralized power plants able to supply electricity over greater distances to cities and more dispersed rural populations. The development of AC systems was critical in serving rural areas. In the early days of the American electricity system, Edison and Westinghouse became fierce rivals, but ultimately, Westinghouse AC distribution system would prevail over Edison's insistence on DC. It wouldn't be long after the invention of the light bulb that centralized electricity would find its way to the southernmost city of Key West. In 1883, John Philbrick organized a gaslight company for Key West and installed a gas plant on Emma Street. The backers of this earlier technology soon saw that the future was in electricity. In 1887, the obsolete gas works was replaced with an electric plant on the same site. It was hailed as the first centralized plant to generate electricity in the South. By the end of the century, electricity was making its presence known throughout Key West. The existing mule-drawn streetcar line was converted to electricity, and the Key West Electric Company began furnishing power throughout the city. Key West was a modern, electrified city by the time Henry Flagler's railroad arrived in 1912. It had gone from whale oil lamps to light bulbs in an incredible 20 years. Henry Flagler's Florida East Coast Railway reached Miami in 1896. Not satisfied with this accomplishment, he began the Key West Extension in 1904. This decision was partially based on increased shipping to and from Key West. There was also an expectation that the upper and middle keys would benefit by providing their farm products better access to markets on the mainland. In the winter of 1907, the first train crossed the mainland to Key Largo with Henry Flagler and a party of friends aboard. A year later, the train would reach Knight's Key Dock in Marathon. By the end of 1908, the upper and middle keys had daily scheduled train service. A seaport city had been built south of Knight's Key, and from there, rail travelers could board a Flagler steamship bound for Havana. While delayed by hurricanes, labor disputes, and financial problems, the final section of the railroad was completed in January of 1912. Unfortunately for farmers and residents of the Middle and Upper Keys, the promise of prosperity did not come with the railroad. The cheaper Havana pineapple took the market from the superior Key pineapple, and the Key Lime crops were overtaken by the Persian limes on the mainland. With the absence of a highway, Electricity and water, economic prosperity seemed to ride right by the middle and upper keys on the passing railroad. During the 1920s, residents of the middle and upper keys were living humble lives. 
Meanwhile, Florida's economic prosperity had set the conditions for a real estate boom on the mainland. Miami had an image as a tropical paradise, and outside investors were taking notice, thanks in part to the publicity talents of audacious developers like Carl G. Fisher of Miami Beach. Fisher even purchased a huge lighted billboard in New York Times Square proclaiming, It's always June in Miami. In the final days of 1925, as the state was experiencing the greatest land boom the nation had seen, Florida Power and Light was born. With cities springing up overnight and residents pouring into the state by the thousands, a dependable supply of electricity was desperately needed. FPNL started from an unlikely patchwork of enterprises which included small electric generating plants, ice plants, water, gas, fish, telephone, streetcar companies, a steam laundry, an ice factory, limestone quarry, sponge fishing boat, and 35 mules and wagons. This patchwork network included a small 50 horsepower generator run by H.S. Mack McKenzie in Tavernier. Then things took a turn. Hurricanes in the 1920s combined with the real estate and stock market crashes sent both the state and FPNL reeling through the depression. With this economic downturn, any thoughts of FPNL expanding further into the Florida Keys went out the window and the Keys community outside of Key West remained mostly in the dark. Prior to the Depression, when the land boom was still hot, the first construction of the Overseas Highway was started. During this time of prosperity, the Dade and Monroe County Commissions jointly decided to connect Key Largo with the mainland by road. Monroe County residents approved a $300,000 bond issue to build a road from Angler's Club down to Key Largo, where it would then proceed alongside the railroad. In tandem, Dade County would construct a road from Homestead South to the Monroe County line via a 2,800-foot wooden drawbridge at the Card Sound water crossing. The Overseas Highway officially opened for the first time to the public on January 25, 1928. At this time, the road was a straight shot to Lower Matacumbi. Cars would then have to take a costly and inefficient ferry to No Name Key in order to complete the drive to Key West. The funding to complete the highway and bridge crossings to eliminate the inadequate ferry was difficult to come by during the Depression. After Monroe County and the city of Key West declared bankruptcy, things became even more difficult, but construction finally began in 1934 with the help of the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. Work camps were built on Winley and Lower Matacombe Keys, and by 1935, about 700 World War I veterans were working there. Not since the construction of the railroad had such dredging, digging, and concrete operations been seen and heard in the Keys. After Flagler's Railroad failed to bring prosperity to the Upper and Middle Keys, and the Depression dampened any possible efforts for FPNL to extend power south, it would take the combination of three events, the formation of the Rural Electrification Administration, the 1935 Labor Day hurricane, and World War II to bring centralized electricity to our island chain. In 1934, the U.S. was lagging significantly behind Europe in providing electricity to rural areas due to the unwillingness of power companies to serve rural and low-density areas. Less than 11% of U.S. farms had electricity as compared to nearly 90% of farms in Germany and France. Just prior to the Labor Day hurricane, the Rural Electrification Administration was created. The REA, as it was commonly called, was created as an agency of President Roosevelt's New Deal. The REA's primary goal was to promote rural electrification. To encourage delivery of electricity to rural areas, the REA made long-term self-liquidating loans to state and local governments, farmer cooperatives, and nonprofit organizations. But just as the prosperity promised by the railroad had passed the middle and upper keys by, it seemed so with the REA. As a study completed by the fledgling REA in August of 1935 indicated, the population of only 751 residents living in 195 homes suitable for electrification could not support a community-wide electrical system. 
It stated that the unique geographic situation prevailing on the Keys means that power needs are not as great as in other rural areas. The study concluded that the primary need of the Florida Keys is that of water, and until that need is provided, it is doubtful that the density of population will increase to the point where electrification is reasonable and justifiable. This study, conducted just a few weeks prior to the Labor Day hurricane, would be invalidated by Mother Nature and the coming winds of war. On Labor Day, September 2, 1935, the most powerful storm to make landfall in the United States and Atlantic Basin came ashore in the Florida Keys. Winds of 185 miles per hour and a 17-foot storm surge devastated the area. Over 400 people lost their lives during that awful night. Many of those lost were War I veterans and their families stationed here to build the highway. Miles of the rock-made causeways and rail beds were washed out. Only a few of the concrete highway bridge piers built by the veterans remained as evidence of their hard work. However, the large concrete railroad bridges that remained standing were a testament to the work of Henry Flagler's engineers and crews. Unfortunately, Flagler's overseas railroad could not survive the hurricane and ended up bankrupt. As a result of the bankruptcy, the Florida East Coast Railroad sold its Florida Keys right away to the state of Florida for a mere $640,000. Now utilizing the rail bed and concrete rail bridges, the state could rebuild a new and improved overseas highway. On July 4, 1938, the highway officially reopened, bringing the Florida Keys a viable vehicle artery from the mainland to Key West. While the 1935 hurricane was devastating, the bankruptcy of the Flagler Railroad prompted the completion of the overseas highway. This created easier access to our islands and created a demand for electricity which set the stage for FKEC's creation. While the Keys were rebuilding after the Labor Day hurricane, the REA was also rebuilding and reorganizing. In 1939, it became a division of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, a change that brought focus to REA's original intent and many previously unviable projects were being reviewed. Shortly after the REA change, a young electrical engineer from Georgia by the name of E.P. McLean was in Washington, D.C. to drum up business for his new company. He learned of an REA inquiry to bring power to the Florida Keys. Based on a hunch, McLean made the long trip south to the Florida Keys. So here we are. It is the late 1930s and the middle and upper keys are essentially in the dark, while just down the road, Key West has become a bustling, electrified city. It was a late Key West afternoon in 1939 when the unknown engineer E.P. McLean asked to meet Key West conch William Porter to discuss a REA electric cooperative. Porter was a Key West developer, owner, and president of the Key West National Bank, Monroe County Commissioner and a charter member of the Key West Rotary Club founded in 1916. Porter was entertaining dinner guests that night but agreed to meet McLean for 10 minutes following dinner. McLean's pitch was very good. So good in fact that 11 p.m. William Porter and all of his guests were still up planning the Florida Keys Electric Cooperative. The next day, William Porter called together several progressive businessmen and the concept of an electric cooperative to serve the Florida Keys outside of Key West was favorably received. A meeting with the Monroe County Commissioners was held and the leaders agreed to employ Ross Sawyer Jr. to assist with promoting the project. Ross Sawyer Jr., a Key West native, immediately went to work traveling the Florida Keys explaining the benefits of an electric cooperative. This was a daunting task and not as easy as one may now think. Despite a growing demand for electricity and the hard work of Sawyer and others, many Keys residents were still skeptical of joining an organization that required a $5 membership fee paid in advance. $5 was a lot of money in 1939, and it was difficult to obtain the 300 memberships required by the REA to start an electric cooperative. The quota was finally met with members like Alan Parrish of Marathon personally buying 20 memberships. 
The vision and determination of the founding leaders could not be discouraged. The benefits of electricity was persuasive enough to officially give birth to the Florida Keys Electric Cooperative on January 22, 1940. With cooperative headquarters of the Marathon Grocery Store, FKEC was born. Four days later, the cooperative held its first board meeting and elected John A. Russell as chairperson. Finally, we were officially incorporated, but that did not mean power was immediately available to our members. FKEC's new board would have to work diligently over the next several months to make electric service a reality. On June 4, 1941, our board authorized a $5 million line of credit with the REA and hired Ross Sawyer as superintendent. His salary, a mere $175 per month. The winds of war had been swirling around for several years, causing shortages of critical materials. These shortages caused frustrating delays to the construction of the FKEC power system. Then, on December 7, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred and everything changed. Critical supplies suddenly became available due to the strategic importance of the Key West naval and air facilities. The outbreak of war also brought about the need of fresh water, which meant a need for electric service for pump stations along the way. This gave FKC priority to receive critical material, equipment, and supplies. To meet the demand, the Navy, in partnership with the Florida Keys Aqueduct Authority, drilled wells in Florida City and began construction of an 18-inch pipeline from the mainland to Key West. In April of 1941, President Russell and the FKC board obtained a partial loan of $50,000 from the REA to start construction of lines. A few months later, the company purchased the holdings of FPNL and McKinsey for $6,230. These holdings included Mac McKinsey's 50 horsepower diesel generator, which he had used to power his shopping plaza in Tavernier. FKC also purchased land and constructed a second generating plant in Tavernier. With all the equipment in place, FKC went online December 1, 1942. During 1942, the FKC headquarters was moved from Marathon to Tavernier, and the first annual meeting was held in the Tavernier Schoolhouse. By 1943, FKC operated a small plant in Tavernier with three generators and had two portable generators in Marathon. With the end of the war, the economy continued to grow. Many of the people who visited the Keys decided to stay. Each new resident meant more members and construction for the cooperative. Power lines from Key Largo to Marathon were fully in service by 1946. It would be a disservice to continue this without fully recognizing our founding fathers who made FKC possible and the actual power delivery a reality. Let me start with Hubert Sherman Mack McKenzie. He was one of the first pioneers to bring electricity to the Upper Keys. In conjunction with FPNL, Mac installed a 50 horsepower diesel generator and electric line to serve nearby residents in Tavernier. The primary use of the generator, which was housed behind the Tavernier Inn, was to power the shopping plaza he began building in 1928. Along with bulk oil storage tanks, he built a gas station, an ice house, hardware store, lumber yard, auto repair garage, drug store, and theater. The theater, built in anticipation of entertaining the World War I veterans building the highway, was not successful and was later converted into a hotel. This hotel still exists as the Tavener Inn located at mile marker 91.8. Mac's daughter Joanne remembers the generator being named Old Hesse. In the beginning, Power lines running along US-1 only car carried power from an old HESI to homes and businesses from Ma Marker 90.5 to Ma Marker 92. Electric service was only offered for a few hours in the morning and the evening. It wasn't much, but it was something. FKC would later purchase old HESI to add to our generation capability. Next is John Augustus Russell, our first board president. Russell was born in Matacombe in 1888 to John Henry Russell and Rosalie Sawyer. His father 
Eilemrod's first postmaster was born in Key West to Richard Russell, a Bohemian immigrant. John Russell served as FKEC's president from our inception until 1946 when he resigned from the board due to health reasons. His leadership during the crucial first few years was instrumental to our long-term success. Next, Alonzo Cawthron, a conch, also brought limited power to the Keys prior to FKEC's inception. In the early 1930s, he constructed a small electric system in his hometown of Matacombe. Like Mac's unit, he only provided electricity during essential hours. Cawthron also installed some of FKEC's first power lines and would later serve as FKEC's second board president. Our final founding father, Eugene Lowe, also a conch, was a lifelong taverner resident and professional fisherman. In addition to fishing, Lowe had worked at the McKinsey Generator facility prior to FKC purchasing the plant. It was only natural that he would become one of FKC's first employees working in the taverner generation plant beginning in 1941. Later, he would be the first plant manager, a job he often did generously without pay. Supplies were scarce during our early years due to the war. FKC was in need of essential equipment such as transformers before it could deliver power. In early 1942, Charles E. Wilson, president of General Electric, booked a day of fishing with Captain Lowe. Wilson also served as a dollar-a-year civilian advisor on President Roosevelt's War Production Board, which happened to control the use of critical war materials. Wilson landed a big tarpon, and sometime during the celebration of his catch, Captain Lowe mentioned how badly the community needed electrical transformers. When Wilson asked how many, Lowe modestly replied, we could use at least six. Only a couple weeks later, the transformers arrived. Imagine the need for a mere six transformers where today every neighborhood consists of dozens of transformers. In 1946, Lowe was elected to the board. He served on the board for 20 years and as president for 17. When he stepped down from the board in May of 1966, he had been associated with Florida Keys Electric Cooperative longer than any other person. Today, we recognize both his contributions and tenure. FKEC currently serves from Key Largo to the beginning of the Seven Mile Bridge. But that territory is very different from the one originally intended. The electric cooperative envisioned by William Porter and the initial supporters back in 1939 planned on the co-op serving all of the Florida Keys outside of Key West. In 1942, FKEC began operating a 100 kilowatt generator to serve portions of Stock Island and Boca Chica Army Station. Electric lines were constructed from Stock Island to Big Pine Key, but were not energized due to the lack of generation. In search of generation, FKC attempted to purchase the Key West Electric Company. This effort failed, and the city of Key West purchased the system and created City Electric, a municipal electric company. When efforts to purchase energy from the City Electric failed, FKC gave up on efforts to serve the lower keys. Today, City Electric is known as Keys Energy Services. The unenergized line from Stock Island to Big Pine was removed in 1945 to provide materials to complete the line between Tavernier and Marathon, and the Stock Island generator and distribution lines were sold to City Electric. FKC continued to have 75 members located between Stock Island and Marathon, but were unable to serve them. After completing the construction of a new steam plant in 1951, City Electric petitioned the County Commission to begin serving these areas and electric service finally came to the Lower Keys in 1953. FKC refunded the $5 membership fee to the 75 members and FKC's service territory officially became the Monroe-Dade County Line down to the Seven Mile Bridge. The latter half of the 1940s were a blur of construction. The 7,000 volt line between Tavernier and Marathon was completed and then upgraded to 25,000 volts. Distribution lines were extended into North Key Largo to the Anglers Club and the recently completed Seaboard Properties which became the Ocean Reef Club. A line was completed between Key Largo and Homestead providing the ability to purchase power from the mainland. 
When the decade of the 1940s came to an end, FKEC had 125 miles of electric lines serving 857 meters, but more importantly, a foundation had been created that would allow Florida Keys Electric Cooperative to serve our members and our communities into the future and beyond.